The Origins Podcast is supported by listeners like you. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting it on Patreon. Subscribers also get access to full video of each episode, as well as bonus content and exclusive perks. Science and culture, together. Visit us at patreon.com slash origins podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Origins Podcast. I'm your host, Lawrence Krauss. Neil deGrasse Tyson is perhaps the most famous spokesman for science in the world today. He's known around the world as the presenter of Cosmos, the director of the Hayden Planetarium, whose renovation he helped oversee, and the host of the podcast, Star Talk. I've known Neil for over 20 years, and we've worked together often. He's invited me to present many times for programs at the Planetarium, and he's come to participate in my own public events, most notably one that erupted into a wrestling match between him, Bill Nye, and Brian Green. I wanted to explore Neil's own origins, what motivated his career path, and what obstacles he overcame to get where he is. I was also eager to record a conversation between two scientists about our own unique perspectives on science and on science communication. Our discussion presents, I believe, a perspective that complements that which many people may get from his tweets, his television appearances, and his writing. Neil was, as always, witty, lively, and at times, pretty loud. Patreon subscribers can find the full video of this program and all our programs the day they appear at patreon.com slash origins podcast. I hope you enjoy the show. Neil, thank you for welcoming us into your abode. <laughs> you set up shop like this is your own studio, yeah, but my a, office. Yeah, we took it. That's why we did it before you came in. And uh, but I really appreciate you letting us. I, I and I compliment it, you on your vest, where the uh, bottom button is unbuttoned. Well, there's two things. That I wore is the a haberdasherial in, detail. Well, that you know, very few people know. No, Show the camera. You're yeah, you're blocking. Yes. And it. I want and I want you to know two reasons. I wore the vest in honor of you. Mm -hmm. And he's and my camera guy is wears the vest, and he was the one who told me I should be. Undoing but the bottom this. button, yeah. I never knew that. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a, a tradition. Rule. It's a true. I think That's, there was some overweight king who mm -hmm. couldn't really actually button it, uh, so he unbuttoned it, and, and that and became the style. Like the yeah. like the Spanish lisp. Sort yeah, of yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah, yeah. the Castilian. Ah. Plus, it allows you to sit down and not bunch up the vest. The vest will naturally then split. I want to start with some with questions that I've never really talked to you about. By the way, I, want, I can't think of a question. Mm -hmm. that you would ask me that you wouldn't already know the answer to. Most of what I know is a subset of what you know. Oh, well, that's right. Well, <laughs> we, well let's accept that fact. Thank you. Okay. Just to be clear. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I'll try and return that favor I'll, later I'll try on. to pull stuff from places maybe you've never visited. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just to enrich yeah. the podcast. Well, I never visited your childhood. Okay. So, so let's start there. Mm -hmm. People, wow, so I when you say go, origins, you mean yeah, your origins, origins of every, my origins. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mentioned yeah. your my origins. My origin story. Yeah, exactly. I want your origin story. Your parents... You come from a family of educated parents. Your mother was a gerontologist, is that right? Well, my mother did not go to college until we were pseudo-empty nest. Oh, really? By prior arrangement in the marriage. Okay. Yeah, so when they got married, they agreed that we'd have they'd have kids first. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, if she retained that interest, she would go to, back to school, which wow. she did. Wow. Got when an you undergraduate only... degree and then a graduate degree in gerontology. So she got an undergraduate degree when you were when, you when were I was high in high school, just getting out of high school. So you school. could almost graduate at the same time. <laughs> and the, I mean, I've heard some people do that where they graduate with their parents. Well, stuff. she so the way she did it was she they had programs for adults yeah. who had to go yeah. back and yeah. get their education. So what you could do this is brilliant. If you wrote up your life experience, mm -hmm. they would then evaluate it and establish a certain number of credits it was worth towards the degree. Oh, that's great. Something that if you're 18 or 21, yeah. you wouldn't have the life yeah, experience. Yeah, sure. But if you raise kids, you... Well, you know, I think, I mean, I've now become a... Having taught at universities, I find a lot of kids go into university without really knowing why they're there. And it's really nice to know, have a sense of why you're, why you're in school. I've, that's more people in community colleges know yeah. why they're in school than yeah. in sort of regular yeah. colleges, yeah, yeah, four-year so colleges. Because they, they, they've... They've tasted the real world yeah, in yeah. some way. Yeah, something yeah. real happened to them. Did you, did you ever think of taking time off, or did I mean I never? I took time off actually in the middle of college. I was worked on a history book, but I uh, when I was growing up, it just didn't seem the thing to do. But did you ever think of taking? No, time? no, I enjoyed my arc mm -hmm. through life, and mm -hmm. time off didn't seem like mm -hmm. it would serve that trajectory. What? But okay, so what? So that's my mother. Yeah. My father uh, studied 
sociology in college mm -hmm. and uh, had a master's in, uh, I forgot precisely the wording of it, but he got it from Teachers College at Columbia. So they and, lived in New York their whole Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, but homegrown yeah. New Yorkers. And so my father had sort of academic roots, mm -hmm. ultimately worked for Mayor Lindsay oh, uh, in New York City during that. the you know heat of the civil rights movement. Yeah, yeah. And so I was sort of baptized into social, cultural, racial issues of the yeah, day. Yeah. Even though that early I knew I w wanted to study the universe. Well, so this juxtaposition kept me grounded. I had a hard time deciding to go into science in a way, although I, I always knew I wanted to do it because it seemed so divorced from people and I was quite political, even all, all the time growing up. And I don't know if you had the similar conflict. No, I, I was. it was not so much a conflict, but... I just carried the awareness with yeah, me in yeah. through my life, and not, then exploited. Not as that it was a. Oh, I gotta also do this. Yeah, that was yeah. never. There was never. You knew interest. you wanted to do science early. Oh on. yeah. Why? Age nine. I was called uh -huh. by the universe. You were called by the universe. Yeah. First visit was here divinely. to the Hayden Planet. Oh, uh, I didn't say divinely. I just said the universe. <laughs> <laughs> you put the divinity yeah, yeah, in the yeah, universe. Yeah, okay. That's what I like to. It's one of my <laughs> divine bits. But um, uh, so uh, my first visit to the New York City's Hayden Planetarium. Is it? And that where, was where that's where our office is right now. Yeah. Yeah. We're recording this. It's a story that I think plays better in a small town. You know, yeah, small yeah. town kid goes away, comes back and runs this stuff. Here I tell that to people. They say, yeah, and your point is, <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's not as impressive Uptown, in a big town. Yeah. But a part of me is delighted, even enchanted by the the duty that I have, sure. have to bring to others what educators and scientists of yore mm -hmm. have brought, had brought to me when I was up and coming. Well, look, I mean, I, I think, yeah, that, I think that notion, I mean, there's very few people who, who are as renowned science communicators as you. And so with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> 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 and, but, but was it really, I mean. Is this a script for a superhero movie? Yeah, what are we doing right, here? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know what, I don't know how we can figure out who's who yet, but we'll worry about that. Plus you need a deeper voice. With great power <laughs> comes great you've, responsibility. You've got the voice. There we go. Thank you. Um, so was it really the, uh, transformative? Was it really an epiphany coming here? Or was it, I mean, when you were growing yeah, up before- Yeah, it was epiphanic. Yes. Yeah. I'm in the dome and the lights dim, the stars come out, and I'd only seen the stars from the Bronx. Oh, which you, can all, you see? A dozen can, of them, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was say. Right. And so the stars come out in the dome of the mm -hmm. planetarium. And think about it, it's kind of planetarium experiences. We probably all remember our first time yeah. in a planetarium dome. Yeah. And in a way, it was the world's first virtual reality yeah, space. Sure. Just yeah, think about absolutely. that, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. You're transformed, the room disappears, and you're just yeah. floating in space. And I was just awestruck, starstruck, I yeah, should say. Yeah, uh -huh. And that starstruckness stayed with me. And uh, first I thought it was a hoax. Was like, there aren't this many stars. Yeah, I know, no, I have no, evidence, <laughs> yeah. I have Bronx evidence <laughs> yeah. that there aren't this many stars. And then I learned later that that is how many, there's yeah. more than that even. Yeah, yeah. And and it was not the space program, even though these years occurred in the late 1960s for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was, I loved that we went to the moon, but that had no forces operating on my ambitions mm -hmm. to study the universe. I knew enough then that the moon is like sitting in front of our noses. Oh, okay. See, and see. I cared about, you know, the Big Bang and uh, galaxies and quasars. Wow, and okay. So that was on a scale far beyond just joyriding in orbit, you wow. know, 200 miles above Earth's surface, or even the moon that is far to our spaceships, but close yeah, for a lot, in, for in a the lot universe. Yeah, for a lot of kids, a space program. I, I knew I was interested in science well before. I'm a little bit older than you, but not a lot. I was, I think, third, I was probably uh, 14 when, when they went to the moon. And um, it still was, I mean, I was profoundly interested in what was going on because I was already interested in science, but I found that profoundly interesting. As a kid growing up, up, in, up in Canada, I want, in fact, I think I started to draft a letter saying that they should have a Canadian astronaut. <laughs> at some, but that for you was not the, epif the epiphany. It was coming here. Not at all. And no. you decided then, did your parents, had they any, did they have any plan? My mother wanted me to be a doctor. Did no, they, no uh, they, I'm actually quite, I don't want to say proud of them because they're yeah. my elders, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm deeply respectful of how they raised us. Yeah, they, sure. They didn't put any of their own life's ambitions on us, either what they achieved or didn't achieve. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Either of those can yeah. end up a force operating on what your, yeah. your, your oh, yeah. you kids become. Lot, right? I couldn't become a doctor. You're going to become a doctor. Exactly. Right? Yeah. You know, who knows who, how many people's actual ambitions were derailed yeah. simply because of the forces on, operating on them by their parents. So they showed no 
force of alignment well, among uh, me or my two siblings. But what they did do is expose us. We had mm -hmm. the fortune to be raised in New York City yeah. in this context, yeah. right? Yes, it was dangerous. Yes, it was, you know, there were riots and all. Yes, all yeah. that. Yeah. That all actually did happen. But we're embedded in quite a repository of cultural institutions. Sure. And so every weekend we did something different. Yeah. Uh, it was, we went to the opera, we went mm. to a play, mm -hmm. we went to a musical, we went to the ball game, oh, we even went great. to a hockey game, went to the art museum, went to the zoo. Wow. And each of these weekends, it might've been two weekends a month, it yeah. felt like every weekend. Oh, but, that's great. And these were, this was exposure to oh, things trained adults do yeah, yeah that's yeah. beyond just the doctor lawyer indian yeah, chief yeah, sure. options yeah and my brother ultimately became an artist having been moved by our visits to art museums and he ended up going to the high school of music and art got his mfa and mm -hmm. and now uh, teaches art and paints and mm -hmm. you know so and, and my sister she's the big sellout she <laughs> yeah. Yeah. she went into corporate america oh well yeah someone had to I she guess. left school but then came back and got her mba and and um so but so, my point is we, it enabled us, it empowered us yeah. to follow our own drummer. Yeah, they sort of planted seeds and you and you got to decide which ones grew. Baby Correct, and then seeds. once they saw these seeds germinate, yeah. they would then feed, uh, so uh, when, what's the, nourish them. So my best example of okay. this, best example, I think you would appreciate this uh, as an academic and mm -hmm. someone who's a voracious reader, uh, it, in middle school, mm -hmm. my mother, not knowing anything about astrophysics, she would she would visit bookstores oh. and go to the remainder the shelf, section, okay. <laughs> right? And just find any book yeah, that yeah. said math or science on yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. or the universe, of which there are many, it turns yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, sure. And she'd bring them home. And these books cost 50 cents, 25 yeah. cents. Oh, that's great. I had the largest library of any middle schooler oh, in my school. Oh, that's so nice. And uh, also brain teaser books, anything yeah, yeah, that was yeah. just fun things to do with your brain uh -huh. rather than just hang out in the street. Oh. And so uh, I probably still have books, some of those books on my shelf. So, they all have some marker uh, yeah, line yeah, across yeah. The, yeah, yeah. the binding yeah. saying that it has been marked down. Yeah. I, don't, I haven't lately seen remainder shelves much yeah. in bookstores. I used to go looking to see if my own books weren't on them. <laughs> 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 no, yeah, I guess it's sad for the author, yeah, but, but great, great for, for the... <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. You got to feel like it's a good thing I thought about happen. that. Yeah, if my books were ever remaindered, I, it would be bittersweet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Somebody who couldn't otherwise afford more, more. it is picking it up for a dollar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's it, you, exactly. It's bittersweet. That's so neat. And so, and just if you want to know, I've never seen any of your books on a remaining table. Thank you. And, okay. and oh, thank you. Same here. But in any case, uh, so she fostered it. What about teachers? Uh, you no, know, I'm, you're a I'm where I am not because of teachers, yeah. but in spite of them. Yeah. Okay. No, yeah. that, and that happens. In fact, yeah. for in physics, in science, unfortunately. That happens a little too much, I think. Yeah, well, so it would happen with girls at the time. Yeah. Uh, we're going way back now. We're going back yeah. 40, 50 years. Yeah. Anyone who did not fit an expectation yeah. of what a scientist looked like or yeah. sounded like, it's not... I, I'm growing up late enough in the history of the United States that, and in the North, so that what I'm describing to you is not explicit. It's just implicit. Implicit. So it's, for example... Oh, uh, you look athletic. Why don't you stay after school and join the sports yeah, teams? Yeah, yeah. I said, no, I want to be on the physics club. Yeah, you know, yeah. and no, no, you, we need you in the sports thing. And and they think they're doing me a favor with these suggestions yeah. when, in fact, deep down, they're, they have no alignment yeah. with my ambitions. Yeah, they're 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 staring. They're typing you. Yeah, they're stereotyping. Yeah. And it was worse for women at that time. Yeah. In fact, I still have a book where it's called Neil School Years, uh -huh. and there are pages for each grade, uh -huh. and it's you put report cards in there and this sort oh, of did thing. Your parent, did your mother keep that book? Or no, did I you, kept the book. You, no, it was oh. a gift to me from oh, my grandmother, oh, okay. and then I you filled kept it, it from third grade onward. Oh, that's right? neat. And so there are the pre-printed pages where they uh -huh. say, list your friends uh -huh. and list your interests, uh -huh. and one of them is what I want to be when I grow up. Oh. And... If you're a boy, there's this set of options. Yeah, if sure. you're a boy, they're the other oh, a girl, no, you're the, the other, other set of the options. Mm -hmm. And the boy could be, you know, a policeman, fireman, yeah, yeah. doctor, lawyer. Yeah. Girl was, you know, stewardess, waitress, housewife. Yeah. This sort of thing. Yeah. So it was, uh, or, or, or mother. 
mother. Yeah, so it was yeah. odd that the girls had the options of being mother, but, but my, my father, father was <laughs> not one of the options <laughs> when you were a guy. <laughs> so that so I was I was actually disturbed by that even at age nine that this is this is not symmetric and yeah, I didn't yeah. understand why not. Yeah. So. But you were able. There was a slot for you to write in what yeah. you wanted to be when you grew up, and it was fifth grade where there's a first appearance where I wanted to be an astronomer. Really? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. And I'm, that was my first visit to the Hayden Planetarium. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. See, well, we have a different. That's my, my point, origin story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah no, okay. I mean it's very different. It's fascinating to see because we you and I do many a lot of things, similar things in certain ways. My, my parents, neither of my parents went to college, and 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 wanted and by exactly what want, they wanted us to be professionals my brother to be a lawyer me to be a doctor he, he unfortunately became a lawyer actually worse a professor of law i don't even know if i would have known quite what an astronomer was for me actually in a way i would have cuz the book that really got me interested was a grade, grade 5 or 6 a book about galileo what book and was that it was a uh, some kids book kids i forget book, the okay. name and uh -huh. you know voyager to the stars or some i you know some mm -hmm. need and i think what appealed to me as much probably because of my rebellious spirit was was seeing the troubles he had. I mean, that he was he he confronted the 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 misconceptions of the world. And so I saw a kind of scientist as hero, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that was but I, I would never have known. I remember a friend of mine who his parents were educated. Many years later I learned he when he was in grade five, he wrote a poem and said, When I w grow up, I want to be a doctor of philosophy. <laughs> and I wouldn't know what that was. Anyway, it's neat to Oh, just so one point about Galileo, if I may. Sure. Over my years of reading mm -hmm. history sure. and thinking about how people think, yeah. something you surely spend a lot of time doing, um, I would not have characterized Galileo confronting people's misconceptions. Okay. I would have characterized that way because most of what people thought is exactly what it looked like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that sense, it's not a, they're not misconceiving See, it. Mean, they just didn't have the benefit of a telescope. So well, you, I don't want to fault people for thinking what looks like it's true. I would rather fault people mm -hmm. for once being confronted mm -hmm. with an objective it, it, reality yeah. experiment, still then resisting what is true. Yeah, yeah no, in, in, in astronomy- So it's a subtle, it's, it's even in, semantic no, maybe, no, no, so I don't want is, to break out of, in a fight on it. No, no, but, you're absolutely right, it's a good point. I think yeah. in astronomy it's true. In, in, in physics it's kind of interesting because uh, I did this experiment once for leaders of the free world uh, where I, you know, they all learned in high school that, you know, things fall at the same rate, but that it had gone in one ear and out the other. But you could do the experiment. You confront, they said, why? It's because it's heavier, yeah. And then you do an experiment. And I loved when I read his books about the, he was, they were, which were very funny and I often say they're- I mean Galileo's book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And in fact, it uh, it's sort of sad. the dialogue me. is quite, yeah. it's and quite witty. I'm exactly witty. And I often think it's a shame when they force kids to read great books of literature that they don't include, like, like it's easier to read than James Joyce and funnier in my <laughs> opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, where he, and he makes fun, but he gets, but he does- Aren't it most books easier to read than James Joyce? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Absolutely. But he always has a foil. So in some sense, it's the person who has the Conception, yeah, and, yeah. you know, and one Simplicio. of the favorite, one of the ones I love is is just a simple thing about well, so heavier things fall faster. What if you have two books and then while they're falling, you tie them together with a rope so they become one thing? Are they suddenly going to fall? And you, no, that's not going to happen. And so that's uh -huh. what I meant. But anyway, yeah. but I, I was too, far more subtle than I thought at age eleven or whatever. It was just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. But it was it, that book exposed me to, and and in my case. My mother told me doctors were scientists, and so I, I got interested in science. And it was much later when I discovered that that doctors don't have to be. I don't want to say doctors aren't scientists because that, but well, the training but is different. Is, yeah, yeah, you don't have yeah. to be. And and unfortunately, did they did you did they teach you in school the same way? I'm, oh, I'm you asked sure. me about teachers. Let me just yeah yeah. Finish I want to talk about teachers. Yeah, yeah. So so I had one teacher in sixth grade mm -hmm. who noticed that all of my book reports were on astronomy books, uh -huh. and that I had a level of social energy that bordered on disruptive yeah, in sure. class. Yeah. And so rather than try to muzzle me, mm -hmm. she noticed in the newspaper there was an ad for classes that you could take on astro astronomy mm -hmm. at the Hayden Planetarium. Oh. And she cut out the little ad and handed mm -hmm. it to me. And then I took it home and my parents read it. So well, let's try this. Yeah. And so I went, I was in the Bronx, so I mm -hmm. took a you know, public transportation oh. into Manhattan. And this was great because this institution, the American Museum of Natural History, beyond the exhibits you see on a first time visit, yeah. there are programs offered in the evening mm -hmm. that transcend everything that's written on an exhibit text yeah. in all fields. Yeah. So there were extra courses and advanced courses and that set me on a path mm -hmm. of further enlightenment beyond the, the school curriculum. Mm -hmm. And so that was an important step 
But that's not a teacher praising me for yeah, anything I was yeah, doing yeah, in class. Yeah. That's a teacher saying, how can we bottle this energy yeah, in some yeah, productive yeah, yeah. way or to, to channel it? Yeah. And that's exactly what it unfolded. So she could be one of the more significant people in my life. Yeah, exactly. No, you know, just giving you that opportunity. You know? Right, right. Yeah. Be beyond that, there was no teacher any time in my life, uh, unlike what is surely the case with you, who would have ever pointed to me and said, he'll go far. Oh, oh okay. that's a guy. Because my grades were never, because yeah. they, they index to grades. Yeah, yeah. And they think the people with high grades are the ones that are going to be significant shakers and movers in the world because the system is constructed yeah. that way. Yeah, yeah. And if you hold aside people who become academics, mm -hmm. who basically all have, near perfect grades yeah, and everything because yeah, yeah. that's the that's the that's the landscape yeah hold aside people who become academics other people who enter the real world if you separated them by who got straight a's and who didn't you are not separating the people who are the most absolutely uh, who are the most uh, um significant on what matters in this world the inventors the yeah. entrepreneurs yeah the, the, and, the and creative types the poets yeah the journalists the comedians the the people the actors the people we that shape civilization as we know it uh, and have an impact and you know what i guess and some I was, famous ones are college dropouts exactly and you know I, it took me a long time i mean i've been an academic most of my life and my trajectory my personal trajectory was always that way i i viewed that as the as the goal and what i wanted to be a professor and mm -hmm. and and um and of course i you know i was interested in writing and and I, I had a i had models of people who were communicators like Feynman and other people but but uh I guess it, does it, everyone had, in your audience know you're talking about Richard Feynman, the Caltech physicist? Now they do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. He's not just a fine man. Now, yeah, he's exactly. Feynman, he was, Richard he's a Feynman. Pretty Feynman. Thank okay. you. That's, no, no, it's good. You keep. It's. I love when you correct me. It's great. I'm and not no, correcting. I just. No, I'm, no. It's. It's. Uh, it's. You did the right thing. If you're Thank building you. an audience, you, you are. are uh, you exactly bring them all with you. But it took me a long time to realize that now I would say, and it's really true, that among the people that I consider the most the 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 most intelligent, the most not just most ambitious, but broadly intelligent and um, creative. I would list more people outside of academia than inside of academia. I don't know. Do you agree? Oh, of course. Oh, by yeah. all means. Yeah. It, uh, not only that, people who are well in academia, you tend to get deep thinkers about yeah. things that most people don't care about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but outside of academia, you get deep thinkers about on, on topics that people do, do care, care about. about, and that's. That but has it's, value. It's but it's more than that. And academics are more more conservative in many ways than you imagine. There's a, it's a discipline where you're supposed to be open to anything. But the the discipline of academia and the good feature of tenure is it makes it very secure. Whereas when you're not in academia, you're not at all secure. And you you really have to constantly recreate yourself or at least create your own opportunities. Where in an academic institution, you got the whole institution behind you, supporting you, and you just do what you want. And it's a very different feeling. It's not only that. In academia, I didn't realize this until I came to this museum, yeah. which has an academic infrastructure yeah. most people don't even know no, about. No, but, Departments, yeah. we have a grants office. Yeah. Yeah. A dean, you know, I'm about to reappoint a dean. Yeah. We have a provost. I report to a provost. Yeah. So... There's the academic trappings that we have here, this mm -hmm. tenure structure, yeah. but most people don't know that. Yeah. But coming here, my mission is bigger than what is my next published paper. It yeah. is, I'm a servant of the public. Yeah. Whereas in academia, it's actually not that. It's, mm -hmm. I need my lab. These are my graduate students. I'm going to publish my paper. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where's my grant money? Where's my office space? And everything is selfish, but it has to be selfish it, the university is the sum of the selfish yeah, conduct yeah. of researchers. Yeah, because teachers have to, I mean, and that, and that's, yeah, again. Whereas here you can't really be that selfish because yeah. the, the, the fundamental dimension of the mission statement is a, you're a servant of the public's appetite. Exactly. It's a different, it's, mm -hmm. and it's a just, it's not as if, it's not pejorative to say one versus the other. It's a different, right. it's a different uh, mission. And I'll add another thing, just to, you, but I, I, I hit this some time ago. It might have been when the movie, the Devil Wears Prada mm -hmm. came out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had not thought about the fashion industry mm -hmm. in any charitable way until I saw that film. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. And here's here's why. And in that film, it's all about fashion. Mm -hmm. It's a fashion movie. Yeah, and yeah. Some of the dynamics that goes on. Yeah, sure. Inside, some could be you know uh, exaggerated, whatever. But if you don't know anything about fashion, this is like. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. This is an interesting... I mean, it's interesting to me. And count to watch. Yeah, okay. So I say to myself, is there anything that is as far from academic physics 
as a profession that you could possibly come up with. And I would say being a fashion model, okay? (laughs) Okay. That is the most opposite I can possibly Mm -hmm. think of, Mm -hmm. all right? Okay. Now, I thought about it, and I said, there exists people Mm -hmm. walking among us that other people will pay money just to look at them. Yeah. Oh my God, no, this is an extraordinary fact. And there are fewer of them than there yeah. are physicists. Yes, yeah. Uh-huh. So what, and they will out earn you. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I said to myself, who am I to value judge? Ah. Oh. An academic intellectual pursuit yeah. versus whatever anybody else does. And I'm embarrassed how long it took me to achieve that revelation. It's now about two decades old for me. Yeah. As a, um, that's late in my life as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. Because I kept saying, well, I could, your intellectual yeah. passion, yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. matters. Yeah, yeah. That's all it's that, easy. and and you just care about fashion. Yeah. And I'm thinking, my God, somebody designed the clothes I'm wearing. Yeah. And it yeah. wasn't me. Yeah. And what that also did, it freed me up to, I, this was a liberation, to not criticize politicians who academics would otherwise criticize for being dumb or stupid or whatever. But yeah. talk about, so let's take George W. Bush for an example. Okay, let's take him. Comedians made fun yeah, of him. Yeah, yeah. Everybody made fun of him. Yeah. And academia, which as you know, is mostly liberal Democrat, anti-war mm-hmm. at vote as voters. Yeah, well, yeah. Point is, you could say whatever you want about the intelligence of George W. Bush, uh-huh. but you know what? He's president, president and you're yeah. not. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. He convinced people to vote for him yeah. and you didn't. You know? so, so to sit on your duff yeah. and complain that he's president and you're not, and whatever it is about his intellectual prowess that he has or does not have, you've got nothing to say, all right? You you want you want to become president and bring your ideas to the table? Then go ahead and run for freaking president and see if you can get 60 million people to vote for you. And pro- champ. You probably can't. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about. Well, right. yeah, no, no. That's sorry to know, scream I, at you, but I yeah, love these it. When were, you scream. I'm screaming because I these were revelatory matter. to me. Yeah, sure. And since then, I've just been so more balanced. Yeah. In my sense of who and what people uh, are, uh, what they think, what they believe, what they care about. Yeah, pomposity is. You, it's great to. It's great to be humbled at some point by observing exactly, especially people. People. I'm always. What amazes me is the older I get, I discover people who can do so many other things better than me. But you know, actually, your story is interesting. It's, it resonates because I once knew I was on. A, I, I had some program was once years ago with a guy who had been vice president of Halliburton, where Dick Cheney had been, and he told me, and he was talking about Tim Cheney about 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 Bush, when during uh, during the whole time when w? Bush was running, uh, yeah, yeah, w, 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 yeah, and Cheney said, you know, and he was this guy was complaining about you know uh, during the campaign, well, how can you, you know, support this guy? And he said, y- you know. And, he, and Cheney said exactly the same thing. He said, you don't like it? You run. Yeah. You run. See how you do. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's a really important point. There's no... Right. There's In a no, democracy or a republic, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, these are the elements. Well, this actually leads me in a roundabout way, which is always fun with you, to... to Did I finish my the, origin story yeah, sufficiently no, for no, the actually, origin No, actually, the one program? thing that amazes me, first of all, I have to say, among the people I've known, you were the most, one of the most focused in knowing what you want to... I've known you an awful long time. And I was yeah, trying we to go think back. First. We actually we go, go back a back. Re- way, way back. I don't even remember when it began, but we go back. Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to think. I know I used to. You invited me to programs here mm-hmm. a long time ago, and I remember you once coming to a lecture I did on on, on uh, science and religion or something. But I enjoyed but, that actually. It was yeah, up in uh, yeah. You yeah. and your wife came, and yeah. I was touched. I remember uh-huh. that. But uh, anyway, it's a long time, and and so I've I've watched, I've I've got, I've watched you progress, and it's been focused. I I, I my life is sort of I haven't had plans. It's sort of haphazard. I've, I've planted seeds and seen which ones take off, but I've, I've not been directed, and I've always thought of you as, as directed. Historically, you made a decision early on after doing your PhD to essentially leave academia, or leave conventional academia. You, you did your PhD, and then you came to, you know, shortly thereafter, to the museum. Was that with malice of forethought? I mean, did you already plan your trajectory and that was part of it? Or did it just be an opportunity that came along? That may have been what it's looked like, but that's not how it happened. Okay, good. Yeah. That's what always fun to see. So I never wanted to leave academia. Okay. Never. Nor did I ever have ambitions of being some famous scientist. Okay. If by what I did, it brought sort of fame and, yeah. and attention, fine. But that was never a goal. Okay. Okay. I guess the counterpart to that 
in the performance world would be, I want to be a really good actor. Mm -hmm. Rather than someone saying, I, I want to be a famous actor. Yeah, I want to win the Academy Awards. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you yeah, want yeah, to be a good actor. And then yeah. whatever happens, happens. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I want to be a good scientist, and I deeply value and love academia. I like the structure, it's students, classes, research papers, conferences. Okay. So I get my PhD, and I postdoc at Princeton yeah. University. Mm -hmm. That's where I am. So the academic trajectory is pretty good from there it's working it's, it's doing its thing <laughs> yeah yeah okay and by the end of my postdoctoral research mm -hmm. fellowship it's a three-year thing uh, there is buzz that the museum the american museum of natural history wanted to sort of update the planetarium it had seen it, it was growing long in tooth yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and the exhibits were kind of old and and so they were looking for advice yeah and I grew up here. That's my place. Yeah. As I said, I'm happy to offer advice for your plans to upgrade upgrade the Hayden Planetarium. So I was on a committee. How did you get on that committee? So others knew this before I knew that the museum needed this okay. to happen. And it was folks at Columbia University. And um, you had connections there. Yeah, yeah I just got my it, PhD at Columbia. There. Yeah. And uh, the board of trustees actually visited Princeton as well. They went to the nearby places that had so, astronomy yeah, departments. Sure, sure, sure. Princeton being just 50 miles yeah. away in New Jersey. So, uh, um, and I just come from Columbia. I was postdocing at Princeton. Yes. The faculty there, mm. both faculty said, well, there's this guy who we know he's had some talents in this mm. way. He might be able to serve you. So how, then they came knocking on my door. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Sure. How did they know you had talents that way? Just because they knew you as a person? I mean... I published my first book while I was still in graduate school. Okay, and so it was clear... And so, you, so you can say, oh, I like doing public things, but if you publish a book, it, yeah, that's yeah, the end yeah. of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, It's okay. done. Because you mentioned you, with, you found a publisher, they're saying. So my okay, first book was let's... Merlin's Tour of the Universe. That was two years before my PhD. Okay, let's step back on again, mm -hmm. because somehow you had to make that decision, which oh, no, wait, 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 wait. impacts on your ability. Yeah, so go on. Okay, before I was at Columbia, I was at the University of Texas at Austin. I, I know well, okay. and I heard a great story by and my friend Steve Weinberg. While, <laughs> uh, I was there when he... Arrived. Moved it, when he moved there, After, yeah. I think it was on the same airplane <laughs> after he was recruited by the University of Texas from Harvard yeah. to bring his physics to there. And you yes. know what the headlines were at the Daily Texan? What? The next day? Because the University of Texas Austin had a very good football team. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Yeah. Highly celebrated. Yeah. And, and so the headline was, uh, UT Austin finally gets a faculty member that the football team could be proud of. <laughs> it was a cute, it was a cute yeah. headline uh, because they were, had aggressive recruiting posture. Yeah, the way they, 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 really, did they did. I remember when I was at, I was at Harvard at the time and mm -hmm. we were watching them try and recruit lots of people. Yeah. You just assemble the, the yeah. program. I mean, yeah. you can do that. I mean, why not? If you, if you care. Yeah. So, so, uh, so where was I? Oh, you were at Texas. So, so while I was there to make extra money mm -hmm. because we were very underpaid as graduate students, I wrote a column for, the, the then known as the McDonald Observatory yeah, newsletter, sure. yeah. which then became Stardate. Yeah. And uh, it's a thin little sort of thing, but mm -hmm. I, it was a, I wrote a question and answer column yeah. called Merlin's Tour of the Universe. Oh, so then you were able to- And then after five years of that- You had a lot of- I had, and I said, maybe this will work as a book. So I didn't say, let me write a book in okay. graduate school. You had already- the Yeah, it had assembled for that. Had you written anything before? Had you written in high school? I mean, look, I, yeah, I, I mean, I did- I was editor-in-chief of my- School's high school's physical science journal, uh -huh. but you're, these are writing science articles. Yeah, yeah but I mean, I, I did history, which is where I learned how to. I mean, for a while, which I learned, I, I always attribute for me anyway, we're learning how to write. Mm -hmm. Generally, I think, well, I know that the way to learn how to write is to write. <laughs> it's just <laughs> well, also writing. to read, to read, yeah, good yeah, to writing. read exactly yeah, to read yeah. a lot. And I was as you, I mm -hmm. was an M of very. I subscribed student, to the New Yorker for many yeah, years. Yeah, and I said to myself, um, it would be extraordinary if one day I had the facility with words the way these writers do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that was, I had sort of ambitions of being as good a writer as yeah, what okay. I was weakly exposed to uh, in that magazine. I haven't read it much lately, so I don't yeah. know where it is or where it has headed since then, but that's definitely... They used to have science stuff in it, and then they stopped. I remember I used to read a guy, yeah, every now and many, then be, the, Jeremy Bernstein, who I used to know years mm -hmm. ago, and still know, but, mm -hmm. but he used to have a column, but then they removed it. Far later, I was I was very pleased to write for the New Yorker, but interesting enough, my my columns were always on the online New Yorker. They would uh, they would mm, never. Mm -hmm. It was some firewall with science <laughs> and and, uh, and and the New Yorker. But anyway, so you so you admire yeah, yeah, so, good so, writing. So that first book. Mm. So what I'm saying is, 
it was not some ambition to be. It was just, yeah. It was available and I could do it and it was fun. You know, and you found an agent or an editor or how did it work? No, it was a, uh, published by Columbia University Press. Oh, and so. generally, you don't use agents for yeah. your first book yeah, with yeah, University yeah, Press. If, yeah, so yeah. anyhow, I, uh, I'm i in graduate school uh -huh. and for a while I'm still writing that column, yeah. right? But then I it gets harder to keep up with it. I just mm. don't. And yeah. so it stops. Um, but that made, it was enough column for two books, oh. just so you know. Oh, okay. Meanwhile, there's other things I'd written. Again, it was just to, to get money. There was, yeah. you write an essay for, for this magazine or that, and I get $500 here or $1,000 there. And this, that makes a very big difference on a, on when you're on a very severe budget. And then after a while, I had a collection of essays. Uh. And that was another book that I published, and it was called The Universe Down to Earth. So what happened was the faculty of Columbia and of Princeton saw that I had this real interest, interest, okay? And said, you should look up Tyson. Okay. They didn't even know that I was native to New York, but I said, I'm native to New York and I have this, I have a ton of thoughts. Yeah. Here's, here's some plan for you here for free. There's, here's yeah. a 10 page growth plan for the yeah. future of the Hayden Planetarium. And afterwards they started knocking on my door more and say, do you want to come and be head of the place? We're going to renovate it. And I said, uh, there is no academic astronomy yeah, department yeah, there, yeah. so I have no interest. Yeah. I said, oh, but you can be head of the planetarium, you'll be famous, yeah. and you'll overnight, because yeah, we're investing a lot of yeah. money, be a lot of media, yeah, yeah, yeah. and later on we can talk about whether we build it. Yeah, I yeah. said, no. Uh -huh. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I don't think they believed me. They didn't believe me for, for like two years. At the end of the two years, I said, are right, you clearly don't believe me. Here's a list of people you should look up, because I think they would be, jump at this opportunity, mm -hmm. but without an academic department, I'm simply not interested. You have the wrong guy. Mm -hmm. And then I walked away. Then, then walking away. Then they came back and said, okay, they, will you come be a director and we'll, we will commit to building a department. I do remember that. was that the birth of this astrophysics I remember, department. I, I remember that vividly. I don't know. I mean, I, I lectured here. There was a longstanding astronomy program. As you point out, they had these evening Long programs. Long ago. And, yeah. and I did From it, From the 1930s, I think before, 1940s, 1950s. Maybe while you were still, still student. I, I mean, In the 70s and 80s, the astronomy department evaporated and was never rejuvenated. Okay. Okay? So the museum viewed it, the planetarium as just an income-generating source rather than as an academic dimension, such as the other departments were. The Department of Mammalogy, yeah. you know, um, vertebrate paleontology, yeah. this sort of thing. Yeah. The, the, the zoological departments that are common in natural history museums were all represented here. Departments of anthropology yeah, as yeah. well. The astronomy department evaporated and was never... Um, so I, my biggest achievement in life which no one is going to know or remember, yeah. and I don't care that they know or remember. But they is, will now know because of us right now tonight. <laughs> is, <laughs> is basically convincing an institution and a board of trustees uh -huh. and donors mm -hmm. and, and that we can build a department from scratch because it was a buyer's market at the time. Yeah. There are other departments here that said, well, you know, they're worried that it would take resources from them. Yeah, yeah. There's the normal yeah, academic yeah, infighting. Sure, yeah, sure. And, but I knew we could do it, and I knew we could make a competitive department, and that's exactly what we have now. Yeah, I do. Oh, I was going to say, I remember that sea change. I so well, at that point, I said, "I'm there." Yeah. And so when I finished my postdoc, I came here. We built a department, and now we have a research department yeah. as well as all the rest of what yeah. goes on here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so and I've never left academia. Yeah, I brought okay. academia with me. <laughs> 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 Forged okay. academia where but I you, landed. But yes. your activities. Oh I mean, no, that's different now. Yeah, yeah. So, so now my personal activities right now, I would say, are ninety percent public yeah. work and ten percent research, and that's just to not fall off a cliff. Yeah. I have possibly delusional ambitions of giving up all of my public activities yeah. and just going back to the lab and you never see me that, again. That, that's not going to happen. Are you too valuable? Thanks for saying that. But let me give my interpretation of that. Yeah. I'm thankfully in a position where I am evaluated professionally mm -hmm. yeah. in whatever is the activity that I do that I can excel in. Mm -hmm. And whatever is the ratio of the public versus research It'll be, it's whatever that is. Yeah. If it's 50 50, is it 70 yeah. 30, 30 70? Yeah, yeah. Whatever that is, that is the landscape on which I'm evaluated. And as you know, especially in physics, if you are an academic in a research program of a competitive university and you start writing books, nobody looks positively. You do that yeah. in spite of its effect 
on oh, your yeah, professional yeah. When I fr- evaluation. Oh, yeah, when I first spoke when I was a professor at Yale, an assistant professor. And oh, yeah, boy, it, it does not, the public doesn't know that. It does not accrue to, to your it's evaluation. Negative evaluation. It's neg- many, it negative. Correct, at least in astronomy, because we had Carl Sagan before yeah. you guys had yeah. it. It became neutral. Yeah. I don't it, think it subtracted. It was like, okay, we don't. And and now it's positive, I think, for the precise reason that science has become big science. And I think scientists finally learned that after the Cold War, stop giving them free money all the time. Yeah. In order to get the government to spend money in science, they actually got to start convincing people that it's interesting. That's, and, and that it's worth doing. And then it's worth having some people who, who, who can out. Who can do that. So that's the, correct. So that's the landscape we're entering where other academic fields have, have basically joined astronomy and astrophysics and to make Sagan that changed the culture i you, think so there were other popularizers before him james jeans yeah, yeah. wrote a lot of popular level yeah, that books. was the book that got me interested in physics as you surely which book, one which one of his physics books? and philosophy oh yeah it's a good book it's, yeah and i you know and i and i have That's one of his, he, he's got a half a dozen eight books or so yeah yeah no and i remember thinking you know i originally in spite of the fact that i poo-pooed philosophy a lot later mm-hmm. i i really that got me fascinated and i almost went when I grew up, well, it's I written by a to, physicist, not by Yeah, I almost took a road why. scholarship to go study philosophy and physics, uh-huh. and I decided in the end to come to the United States and do physics, which I'm happy about in retrospect. You could have done physics as a road scholar. Yeah, but I wanted to do physics and philosophy, and I would have been seduced, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, to okay. the dark side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what I do is, when a request comes my way, mm-hmm. I don't evaluate, oh, do I have time to do it? Should I do it? I, that's not what I, do I say, can I do this uniquely Mm -hmm. and if i say no i think other people can do this then i decline interesting because i mean i've we've talked a lot over the years why i did cosmos yeah yeah i was approached by Mm -hmm. andrewian who's the the keeper of the flame yeah yeah. carl sagan and cosmos she's his his um his widow yeah his widow yeah and she's a creative force in the original cosmos in the second cosmos in the third cosmos and she approached me and i said so is cosmos going to happen again maybe yeah. are you interested yeah and i said and i thought about it and i said you know there are probably a lot of people who would want to do this i don't need to get yeah. it but i said wait a minute i met carl in a certain yeah, way were- with a story and i could possibly do this uniquely yeah yeah so then i said yes but only after thinking I'll about, think about it. that interesting i mean i talked to her years before because you know i was already sort of interested in in or been doing tv and stuff we mm-hmm. talked about this you know she'd been thinking about this for years i mean because carl you know, she wanted to carry his legacy yeah. on. And, and, and she's done it successfully, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. But I, I have to say, I do remember, I think the time I remember meeting you now that it comes down, most specifically, and it may have been before, is is I'd done some things at this museum, public lectures, evening lectures, that was a long tradition of evening lectures. I remember there's one book that had me sign. Oh, and, oh that and, was for the uh, the Amateur Astronomers Association. Yeah, yeah. yeah the book that has Einstein's signature yeah, they, in it. Yeah, and, and I'd done that when I was at Yale. But then when, when you invited me back... Um, I just, I remember the pride. I mean, you'd, it all had changed and you'd said, look at, then you showed me the research. For, and you said, look what I've got here. And you yeah. was like a kid in a candy shop. It was mm-hmm. just, it mm-hmm. was really exciting. Okay, but that's interesting. So the fact that you wrote in, in oh, college. Oh, sorry. One last thing. When I started working here, yeah. I was interviewed um, for there was some cosmic event and there's always mm-hmm. a room to interview an yeah. astronomer. And the editor-in-chief of Natural History Magazine uh, overheard that interview it was on NPR uh-huh. and immediately called me up yeah, and said, we want you, would yeah. you write a column for the magazine? Uh, and I said, I don't, you know, every month that feels yeah. oppressive. Let me just pause for a minute and think this through. And I said, if I were to write articles, what would it be on? And I wrote a list of 50 articles mm-hmm. that I could just do off the top of my head. Yeah. And I sent that to her that that's good enough to start this. Yeah, okay. And so uh, I would ultimately write about 120 articles, and that became the source of three other books. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. I've written. Is it? Is the, I mean, the huge seller is is that? From, oh yeah, it, from that. Yeah, it's, from been, it's been modified. Uh, almost every essay in there had first appeared in, okay, in Natural history, history Magazine. Effort. That's correct. Yeah. But at a time where I mean, I it's been tuned and and shaped for an audience with a slightly shorter attention span. <laughs> so it's curated, yeah. mind blowing. Mm. astrophysics yeah sure and it's not astrophysics for dummies it's, holding aside the fact that that title was already taken yeah 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 <laughs> holding that aside it's actually real astrophysics yeah, you yeah. go in there no you can't just breeze through it yeah it's, yeah it's but the chapters are short the, yeah. the tactic was mm-hmm. here's a tactic it's if you're having trouble with this paragraph the next paragraph is four words long okay so, so you, you yeah. see ahead that there's, it's gonna be easy there's yeah. a little bit of breathing yeah. you're having trouble with this page 
the chapter ends in three pages, yeah, yeah. right? So there's nothing, Not so daunting. I'm never dragging you yeah. through muck and mire. I, I've often thought in terms of, of that kind of thing, that if people can read in the bathroom, <laughs> that, that, that they're not going to be so daunted by the possibility. If they think they have to spend four weeks reading intensively something in order to get the idea. And because science, I, I often say that when it comes to history books, people want long books. Science books, people want short because it is immediately, to many people, daunting. And the book that I published just after that mm -hmm. is basically a history book. Yeah, I know it was the book. the, yeah, the yeah. Um, accessory to war. Yeah, I was proud of you for that. Book, the, <laughs> I never told you. About the it. Un the for... unspoken alliance between yeah. astrophysics and the military. That's a full up, you know, yeah, that's fully a, yeah. indexed and, yeah, and no, no, five hundred right. page. Yeah, yeah. And it took fifteen years, basically, from yeah, concept yeah, call, to. I, yeah, I did the math, and I said, if I wrote this alone, it would take me a thousand years. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I brought yeah. in a co-author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which no. keeps that going. Yeah, no, you know, it's, it's it works in many ways. Like if you have a co-author in a research paper, you know, you it forces you to to keep that moving. Yeah, and the pace yeah. of exchange. Of course. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, you can get lazy. I right, let me go on vacation for now, and yeah, I'll come no, back. No, I'm gonna you know be running some programs on on my origins project on collaboration, creativity, and in different fields, including science, because I don't think people realize how collaborative enough science is, oh, right. and how how it's exact. It's not just ideas. It's someone carries the ball while you have other things, or you. Right. And people have this idea that science, like because of Einstein, I think, and maybe Newton. You know, science is done by someone in a room in the middle of the night. Yeah, burning the midnight oil. Alone yeah. with, the pif you know, with yeah. sudden revelations. It and, is so not that. Yeah, it is so not that. Mm -hmm. It's so not that. Oh, I want one last thing for you before we move on. And there's a reason to talk about you because you are you are a public figure and I want to talk science and you and I have talked about many things over the years, but I think it's important for people to see tra different trajectories. Just like one thing you said that's also really important about grades. I think a lot of kids get turned off science because they're not the best in their class. And there'll always be people better at anything almost than anyone. It's true but, for everyone but two people. Yeah, what was that? It's true for all but, oh, but two one, people. Yeah, all but, but two people. Better and worse people than you? <laughs> yeah, is yeah, that true yeah. for all but two yeah, people? Yeah, exactly. Yes. But I know Nobel laureates who were not the top of their class. I mean, it takes all types. And the key thing, I think, is what your teacher did for you, the one teacher who had a positive impact, which is to say, let me encourage whatever it is that interests you, because that's the ultimate thing. It, it's interest it's as you said it's it's i mean academia is selfish for a reason most scientists aren't doing it because they're trying to, to change the world or improve. they're doing it because they like it and that's what causes good science because if you don't like it you're not gonna spend 20 years of your life trying to solve something that may go nowhere so i think your the, the your enthusiasm i think was one thing the last thing i want to ask though is it interested me that it was your writing that opened doors, but then yes. you mentioned this interview because you, one can't be in a room with you without recognizing your charisma. You are Thank you. A I don't charismatic think about person. it. I just, of course, if we idea. don't, I mean, if yeah, you did, you wouldn't be charismatic, it. but, but <laughs> that's how that works. Yeah, yeah, I think it does. I think it does. Some people can fake it, but I think on the whole, uh -huh. but the interesting thing to me is that you didn't do a lot of public speaking uh, before. It wasn't, you didn't take advantage of going to planetary speak or going when you were a student or 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 before the no 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 i mean other than scientific conferences where you just present your yeah, paper I see no no it was not i mean i i did do some public speaking but no it was not a fun it was not a, a deep part of my activities okay. i would say my modern public speaking mm -hmm. is largely shaped by my efforts to communicate in the media yeah 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 i remember my first interview where i was on national television they, it, the new planet had been discovered, first yeah. planet had yeah. ever been discovered. And I gave my best professorial reply. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing got sound bitten down to 90 <laughs> exactly. seconds. Yeah. And I said, oh, they don't, even though they came here to interview me at yeah. the planetarium, yeah, they don't want what I would normally do here. Yeah. They want yeah. something that fits their media. Yeah. So I practiced sound bites. Oh. And I it helped me sharpen the juxtaposition of information with something that makes you smile mm -hmm. and something that's tasty enough that you'll want to run sure, and tell someone sure. else. Yeah, yeah. That's the anatomy of a soundbite. Yeah. And that's what they found within my 20 minute interview yeah, yeah, yeah. to make it 30 seconds. And I said, why don't I just give 90 second sound bites? And that way it's pre-parceled. When I started doing that, they all came Clinton. running. No, it's really, I remember, well, that's interesting. Now, it Ooh. helps that I'm sitting here in New York City, which yeah. is a, a major news gathering headquarters. That's, that really helps yeah, a lot. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. but I, it's funny, when I, you know, I've over the years done many, many interviews, and I've always had fun saying, okay, I'm going to try and do a soundbite, and I'm going to, 
I'm going to bet it'll become the last line of the column or whatever. And it's always, it almost always is because coming up with good sound bites is not just pandering. It's really, there's a reason for it, as you point oh, out. Yeah, yeah. And it's, did, it can trigger interest and spawn further investigation. Did you, when you say you practice, did you? I looked in a mirror and I had, uh, what you have is you have someone sort of bark out to you, yeah. single word of anything in your field. So yeah. Black hole. Yeah. Saturn. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the sun. Yeah. The uh, Big Bang. And we can try it, right? Yeah. Say anything in my field. Say anything in your field. Yeah, Dust. Dust. <laughs> like, uh, no, wait, 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 hang on, hang on, hang on. So. <laughs> <laughs> the regions of the universe uh -huh. where gas clouds become so cold that atoms come together and make molecules mm -hmm. and molecules come together and make dust. And these are atoms forged in stars that had given their lives beforehand. And this dust ultimately makes planets and life. So we... Our stardust. Our stardust. Okay, good. That's okay. a soundbite. Okay. That's a soundbite. It's a great soundbite. And they would use that entire three yeah, sentences. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, whoa, I never knew that. Oh my gosh, that's what happens. And you get a little education in there. Atoms become molecules. Molecules become something we call dust. Mm -hmm. So that's, so I, I practiced that. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, let me think. Well, you take some hydrogen. Or, no, that's not relevant. Mm -hmm. They're not going to no, remember yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. This, the the soundbites should contain yep. that which they would have remembered mm -hmm. The next day. Okay. In a longer yeah. explanation that you would have given. And, okay, good. No, I, I, I'm i with you. And, and it, you know, you, I'll do a soundbite for you sometime when you invite me in back okay. on Star Talk or wherever. <laughs> we'll so, try it. We'll, we'll yeah. try it. I got one. Ready? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, let's try it. Ready? Okay, what the heck? You ready? Uh, and you're a particle guy, right? Yeah, well, throw it at me, and, and I'll tell you if I can do it or not. Okay. And uh, if I can't, we'll cut it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, quark. Quark. It's a kind of cheese. <laughs> <laughs> the, the amazing thing is that people are as different as you can imagine. And when you look around the universe, it seems like it's made of so many different things that it's unfathomable. What's amazing to me is that what science has discovered is that you and I and everything we see are made of the same things, these particles called quarks. At the basic level, we are all the same, made of things that are, as far as we know, infinitesimally small, and amazingly, even though we know they're there, we also know that you can never see a single quark. Not bad. How much, what do we give him? Cameraman? I give him a B plus. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Quarks are harder than dust. I'm sorry, I threw dust in because I started. Okay. Okay. I, I mean, I wanted to do this, but mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, it, and it's one of the reasons that I think biologists sometimes have a hard time, is that, uh, because some of the aspects of, of the field are, are so complex that it's hard to get to them in a way that people can into it. And the point is, uh, the challenge that, and I've, I wrote a book on this recently, the challenge to getting to quarks versus dust. And, is that and the this book is, that I blurbed? Uh, you blurbed a number of books. It's probably the book you blurbed, but yes. <laughs> and you've been kind enough to blurb a bunch. Um, the problem and uh, that I consciously recognize- The one where I called you the bard? Yeah, you did. Of, you, the, you, you, it was a beautiful blurb. You, well, in fact- you're as good with blurbs as you are with sound bites. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, my goal in a blurb is for it to be the shortest blurb, blurb on the on the on jacket. The jacket because yeah. you and so then generally they put that first. first yeah, 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 yeah. And then you, it's not that I don't want to put words, but you, it's the choice of words. Yeah. Okay, but, but I wanna, how does that phrase go? I'm sorry, this letter is so long. No, long. If it was it's so it's so I, long, if it was better, it would. Not I ran out of time to make it short. Short. Yeah. yeah if yeah, I'd worked okay. longer, I would have been shorter. Yeah. But here's the thing that more seriously, a little bit when the challenge of science and say with particle physics versus to some extent astronomy, the frontiers of particle physics are so far removed from people's experience that it takes many steps to get there before you can really appreciate what's there. That's why my last book is a lot longer than it would have been. And the point is to get to quarks is a lot more, is, you know, atoms, molecules, and dust is something as people can have in some sense at some basic level and intuitive appreciation of because of school and stuff. Quarks are just so far removed that 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 it's hard to know how to get there in a really short time. But I, that, I don't it, agree. Okay, quarks. You do it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. okay you, yeah. Do you remember in chemistry class you learned about like protons and neutrons? Uh -huh. There are particles inside of those. Mm -hmm. They're called quarks. Mm -hmm. And the proton had a positive charge and a neutron had a negative. Quarks have fractional charges. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. And when we discovered this, the guy who discovered it named them after a word in a James Joyce novel. Mm -hmm. 
and and three quarks for cork muster muster uh, mark muster mark mm -hmm. and that's back when we thought there were only three quarks we've discovered more since then mm -hmm. now we recognize that quarks are f more fundamental than protons and neutrons quarks one of the fundamental particles in the universe well it just sounds better when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> and I add, now, if, they, long, if they come back for more, if they come back for more, mm -hmm. I add, <laughs> we've only ever found them in pairs. Actually, they come in threes. Th threes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Then pairs, okay. and pairs. I, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. At, at least pairs. Yeah, okay. yeah, right, yeah. Let me say it different. Okay. We've never isolated a single That's quark. That's what I try to, yeah. yeah. Okay. They're oh. always bound with other quarks. Well, why don't you just split them apart? We tried that. Mm -hmm. Here's what happens. You try to pull them apart, apart and, and to do that, you're putting energy in it like you're pulling a rubber band apart. You got to take energy. And you know how much energy you're putting in? Eventually, it snaps. You put in so much energy, E equals MC squared kicks in, and it creates another I mean, quark. quark yeah. And bada bing. Bada now bing. you got pairs of quarks just the way you began. That's what, that's what I was just going to say to you. I was first going to say it takes more energy than there is in the whole entire universe to create a single quark. But the point is, that's not the case because if you got that much energy, you can produce a lot of other particles and you get the, the rubber band stretch. Actually, the way I would say it now is I'd say it's like you break the rubber band and now you got two rubber bands. And that's what happens with quarks. Anyway, together we could work on this. <laughs> I think we got to... Okay, well, this this went in an interesting direction. Okay. Um, oh, you know I'm how trying to think what people want to hear, it. and I think one of the things that people want to hear is to talk, talk a little bit of science. In the end, there's only four, as far as we know, only four fundamental particles. And you have quarks, electrons, mm -hmm. photons, light, mm -hmm. and neutrinos, this other mysterious particle we'll get into later. Yeah, instead of electrons, it's leptons, really, because there's three kinds of electrons. Yeah, but you have to, but that's, yeah. and so they say, who that's, ordered that? See, right? that's your problem. Yeah. What you're trying to do you is give teach too much. it all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So you start with something that is defensibly pedagogically sensible. Mm -hmm. You talk about the particles that exist in the realm in which we experience. Uh -huh. Okay? Yeah. Then that. when they come back, is it, you know something? Those just represent families of particles. Mm -hmm. We have three or four of whatever is the, the supersymmetry. We have families of these three particles. Families, yeah, 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 we got a heavy electron. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Then then you take them there. And then you say what your guy here in Columbia said, Rabbi, which, which when they discovered it, when they, the heavy electron, he said, who ordered that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been was, saying about everything. Yeah, right, yeah, since then. yeah. No, it was, a, yeah. it was a great thing. Like, who ordered that? It's right. like, why should the world, we still, one of the big unanswered questions is why are there families? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of particles. I yeah. mean, we could we could do a whole program where we start with the desire to sound bite about a quark and lead that into Well, it. so, but I do this all the time. For yeah. example, uh, I, I, I don't want to say I delight in this because mm -hmm. it's a bit snarky. Mm -hmm. So let me just say I watch for it when it happens. Mm -hmm. When someone wants to correct something I said because it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. All right. So I'll say... The Earth has a circular orbit around the sun. Yeah, and they'll say, and some uh, say, you're wrong. It's elliptical, yeah. No, they say, no, it's elliptical. Yeah. And so I say, well, then I draw on a page mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the elliptical orbit that is Earth's it's, orbit, it's so, and, and then I draw a very elongated ellipse. I say, which of these do you think comes closest? <laughs> no, 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 I draw a perfect circle, yeah. and then I draw yeah, an ellipse, ellipse. Which I, and they point to the ellipse. Which is wrong. And it's, which is wrong. Yeah. Right, so I say... It is more a circle than it is any ellipse you're currently thinking of. Yeah. Apart from that, okay, let's call it an ellipse. Uh -huh. Actually, it's not an ellipse because Earth orbits the common center of mass yeah. that it has with the moon. Yeah, yeah. So it does loop Little, the loops loops. Yeah, yeah. around this arc. It's epicycle. Okay, right? exactly. Oh, by the way, the path that the Earth takes around the sun does not close back on itself. Mm -hmm. It's not really an orbit in that sense, mm -hmm. all right? Because the it processes. Uh -huh. So it is a non-closed, um, a lissajou drawing elliptical shape. The point is, if you put all that information up front, you're losing the other points you're trying to make. And you are allowed pedagogical approximations. Otherwise, you cannot communicate in any way with someone who doesn't know anything. Oh, absolutely. You, you can communicate with people who know more. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones who are usually showing off their knowledge yeah, that they yeah, can yeah. take you to levels yeah, yeah. that are... But I no, I think you're right. Although, uh, I... This is, I was talking about Australia, and no. I said, mammals got to Australia, and they all became marsupials. <laughs> 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 and no marsupials yeah. anywhere else. Someone said, wait a minute, there's the opossum yeah, yeah, yeah. in North America. That's That carries a job. I said, okay, fine. I don't, I, I don't have a problem with it, 
but the, I was making a whole other point. That yeah, you can yeah. strand a branch as of, long a, as, of a genome and it, and it takes on yeah, properties yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, we could, and one could talk about mm -hmm. isolated populations and that could yeah, all. Yeah, yeah. But look, this, it's actually fun to have for us because we're both, you know, we're both communicators to talk about the the things that we think are good and bad. One, I'm not saying it's, it's good or bad. It's ne necessary. Necessary, but what's yes. necessary? I of course it's necessary to make approximations to communicate, even in even in in well in any field. I mean, science is an approximation of the universe at every level. You're approximating, but but I think it's important at some level, especially when you're given the time in writing, to make it clear it's an approximation. The only thing we all mislead. I remember the first time I wrote a book, and and I got a you know I got a fan letter. And a guy said, I loved your book. And I learned this. And it was, whatever he learned was nothing what I said. And I was depressed for a while. And then I thought, well, the problem is I can't control what people get or what I write. And I'm- You sort going to be, of can? Well, in spite of that, what I want to say is <laughs> there, will, there will always be misconceptions about what you write. The one thing you shouldn't do is lead, is give knowing knowingly give misconceptions. That's the only thing as a- writer or reader of other popularization in science that I have no tolerance for is when people knowingly mislead. Because I could say, I could say to you, you know what? You know what, Neil? Inside of quarks are little elephants. Okay? And there'd be people that would believe it because I said it, you know, and I'm a particle physicist. And the point is, I may have some reason for doing it, maybe because it's my pet theory that there are little elephants inside quarks. And I want to get that out there, although none of my colleagues like that idea. So, we we at some level we have to make approximations, but we we have to be very careful to to sort of frame them within the context of sort of innocent approximations that don't knowingly lead you mislead you on the wrong direction. Of course, you know. Of course, and that's I think that's the skill and demand. You, you have for, to be skillful about when you make an approximation and when you don't. Yeah, yeah, and exactly what the consequences of that approximation are, and saying the Earth is a, you know, the orbit of the Earth is a circle going around the sun. That's perfect. Which I get. never have because people do know oval. Yeah, so I don't have to get them up to. I don't use elliptical as a first time. Mm -hmm. They know that an oval. I say Earth's shape is an oval. Yeah. It's not much of an oval, but an oval. Yeah. I, so I, I do. I do go there. But if if the shape of Earth's orbit was something they never heard of. Mm -hmm. And a circle comes very close to it. I'm going with a circle. Later on, yeah, exactly. if they want to get deeper, we can get yeah. deeper. And so that, but as I was say, mm -hmm. I say that it's kind of, an, especially since I know where you're going, it's kind of an innocent and useful approximation, as opposed to one that leads you to think something to go in a direction. Of course. Yeah, and then people depend on the quote experts to to lead them in the right direction, give them the correct perspective, if not the details, because the details almost never matter. It's correct. Perspective. And people don't know that details don't matter in most cases. Yeah. yeah. The other the other thing that I want to talk about in terms of technique before I actually we talk about science and government and, and some other things is that I know I, I I sense that I know you're you're trying to engender and you do very well is awe. By the way, you do that by not telling them that it's awesome. Of course, yeah. <laughs> of course. But what? But it's part of its delivery. Okay, and you, you know you were and part of it is the fact that you know you delivered the way you do it. Then you have a Neil. Rest Tyson delivery, and and that's that's a thing. Okay. That's a thing. Well, okay. I noticed it. I mean, it's okay. you know, it, mm -hmm. besides being louder, and, <laughs> but 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 no, but it's almost. And I want to use this word in a play way. It's almost religious in the sense of saying uh, of a evangelical. style. It's evangelical. evangelical. That's the word you're looking and I, for. Yeah, it is, all, and it's fine. And I think we should all be evangelists for science. But I guess I want to ask you: uh, Did you go to church when you were younger? Yes, uh, my. As a family, we went to Catholic Church. Catholic Church. Weekly. So it wasn't, so I'm just wondering if the style is just unique to your personality, or did you ever see role models who sort of had an evangelical fervor to the way they spoke that got a group of people moved, as happens in in a lot of churches? Not in Catholic churches. Not in Catholic, <laughs> no, no, they never do in Catholic yeah. churches. Yeah, we're not, this is not the Baptist yeah, revival. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, no, not, definitely not in Catholic churches. And I went to church early enough mm -hmm. on, in in the history of Catholicism. Yeah. So early enough when the priest faced away from the parishioners yeah. and spoke only in Latin yeah, yeah. Uh, f during the important parts yeah, of the yeah. Mass. He would, and we would face you later and mm -hmm. give a give yeah. a delivery, but the, the Mass is a very sort of impersonal thing yeah, yeah. relative to other yeah. Protestant traditions. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, no, no, it was more empirical. It was... I'm being called to communicate because there's an eclipse or mm. Pluto or whatever. Yeah. 
I might as well try to be as good at it as I can be. Let me monitor their reactions as I speak. And then you learn. When I use these words, oh, their eyebrows open. Yeah. When I, you know, this may be impossible if you're autistic or mm -hmm. on the spectrum. Yeah. To, to be, but I'm reading people's body language sure. as I communicate with them, wherever it is I'm, if it's in the street, is their body square to me yeah. or they turn slide because they really want to finish the conversation yeah. sooner and they can't just tell me they got to leave. <laughs> no. So, so I'm monitoring this. Do, yeah. do their eyes brighten? Sure. Do they come back with a question? Yeah, yeah. As I do this, I'm honing methods, tools, and tactics to communicate as potently as I possibly sure. can. And I will add to this that in the era of Twitter, mm -hmm. I have been more effective than ever before. Yeah. Because I will post a tweet that it's not where I am and what I'm doing. It's something about the universe. Yeah. It's basically a soundbite. Yeah. And I monitor I was just going to get to the fact that your soundbites lead to beautiful tweets, what, right? What, that, exactly. So I, I look to see how people respond. Yeah. Did they laugh where I thought they should laugh? Yeah. Did or they laugh at something I had not intended? Did they misinterpret it? Well, could I have been clearer? This has honed my communication skills like no other force on my life. Yeah, no. The I, feedback. Well, I, yeah, no, and I want to talk to Twitter because you, you are a huge force on Twitter, and Twitter's had a huge impact on you in certain ways. It's a, but one versus the other. But it's interesting when you say this because I was talking to Ricky Gervais, and we were talking about humor. And I want to talk about humor, too, which is another facet of, uh, I think, both of our, uh, way we try and approach uh, reaching people. But he was pointing out as a, as a comedian— Ricky. Yeah, yeah, Ricky was pointing out, as a comedian, you're doing the same thing as a scientist. You're honing your act, and you're watching the audience. So by the time you get to see the act of Ricky's on a television show, it's gone through a lot of empirical testing so that you use what works and you, and you, and you throw out what doesn't. And I think- Even and, if it's against your, you know, what you thought would work. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, that's yeah. the best thing. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, I think, where scientific training helps, because- the great thing about science is learning to throw things out you felt so dearly about. I think that, right. for me, that's the greatest legacy of science, is, mm -hmm. is that you're required. You have a pet idea that turns out to be wrong, and you have to throw it out. Mm -hmm. It's probably almost the only area of human activity where not only do you have to do that, it's, it's, it's a central part of progress. Mm -hmm. And, and I, 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 for me... I like to say, and I don't know if you've had such experiences. I like the way you say that, a central part of progress, because as you're going down the road, you don't even know where the road leads. Exactly. There's stuff in the way. Yeah. And you you get the bulldozer, push it off the road, because it's not helping you move forward. It's not, and, yeah. and, and I don't know, and for me, I've had those experiences, and I always say, I hope some student, or every kid, everyone, has at some point in their life the, the, the experience of having something that they hold very dear to them, some idea, proved to be wrong, because it's something it's that liberate. conspiracy theorists don't understand. It, did, uh, yeah. And this is, you know, Miss may be out of left field. And do you do you have an example of that where you first saw something you thought was, you know, what what was the first thing you saw in science that really sort of went against what you really thought was the way the universe was? I try not to think how the universe is without yeah. actually learning how it is in the first place. But yeah, well, it the, still has no, but, no, I give, but I do have some examples. There are things that I thought were true that later in life learned they were not true, yeah. or I slightly misunderstood it. Yeah. And that was astonishing to mm -hmm. me. It was, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Okay, I have one for you. You ready? Okay. Easter, mm -hmm. uh, for me, for, I for 20 years of my life, mm -hmm. it was the first Sunday mm -hmm. after the first full moon oh. after the vernal equinox. Ah. Oh. Okay. 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 That's really, that was for the first 20 so, years of life, that's how you defined Easter. Wow. No, 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 no. That's what, it's not how I defined it. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm it, very it was, impressed. It was my understanding of Easter oh, in oh. the Gregorian calendar. Oh, oh, okay. The Gregorian calendar redefined Easter. Y yeah, okay. For all of the Catholic world at the yeah. time in 1582. Mm -hmm. And the Protestants were later to uptake mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. um, this new definition. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, turns out it's not that. It's the first Sunday after the first full moon, after March 21st. After literally March 21st? Yes. So that's the religious yeah. equinox. Oh. And then there's the astronomical, astronomical equinox, equinox, which is not which could go to the 22nd or go to yeah, the 20th. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And right now it's, it, happens to be, it happens to be in, in March 20th, mm -hmm. which was awkward in the year 2019 because there was a full moon mm -hmm. on March 21st. Oh. 
So Easter would have been, according to my yeah. definition, the very next Sunday, yeah. like two days later yeah, or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but it was not. And that confused me. So I had to call up all my expert friends oh. said, no, no, no. You're using the astronomical equinox. It's the religious equinox, which by definition is March 21st. Okay. Yes. And and what was your reaction to learning that? Was it I was a little embarrassed that I would oh. have been publicly oh. saying okay, this. Okay, well that decide, yeah, I'm okay, because you're a public figure, but let but personally. I was, was, oh, no, that I was glad to have. Is it, it was fun. Corrected it. Oh well, yeah, yeah that's the like, point. Uh, and and I tell people often, I want to learn something new every day. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. being proved you're wrong is actually mm -hmm. personally well, for, not for everybody, but if yeah. it's fun, it, the aha experience is essentially saying, aha, I never right. realized it was that way. Right, and we get a kind of inner joy at that because they always said March 21st, and yeah. for many decades that was when the equinox landed. And I did not give myself the occasion to imagine yeah. that even the Jesuit priests who came up with this would yeah. have anchored it to that day on the calendar and not actually chased it to the equinox because yeah. they knew enough astronomy, yeah. even pre-Galileo, to know when the equinox, what what you know, what day the equinox occurred on. Anyhow, that was the most recent, and that was just yeah, a few, sure. we yeah, well, that's a few weeks ago well, from the time of this a recording. Lot about that. About yeah. About a subject about Easter, which I never and really Passover about. is the first oh, full moon is after the equinox because the Jewish calendar is really lunar based. It's right? lunar based, and but you do it on the full moon. Don't 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 look at me. Your people, <laughs> <laughs> your your genetic my brethren, ancestors, your genetic brethren. brethren. Yes. yes, in fact, my in fact, I have to say that twenty three and me told me that they are definitely my genetic. Brethren. Okay, what is it again? So I know. Okay, so. So it turns out the Jewish definition mm -hmm. of the equinox is the same as the Christian one. It's just March 21st. Oh, I see. Okay. So it is the first full moon after March 21st. Oh. And so the way the Catholic Church said we're never going to have these overlap because there was a risk of that happening the way it was previously defined. Yeah, okay. It was previously defined as the first Sunday after the equinox. Okay. That's uh, it. The, the full moon was yeah. not even in the picture. Oh, okay. Okay. And until 1582, um, the Julian calendar was not properly accounting for leap days. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. And so it had a leap day every four years that overcorrected the calendar. We had to start taking out leap days to recorrect it. And we had accumulated 10 days that didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. You got me started on this. But yeah, I'll, I know. I'll finish in 10 seconds. Uh -huh. So I've heard took, that before. They took out the 10 days, <laughs> jump started the calendar. Uh -huh. October that year lost 10 days, uh -huh. which was interesting for how you're going to pay rent. Uh -huh. You have to invent sort of amortizing rent schedules. Uh, and and so, therefore, and they added just for good measure. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna let you go because I know that ten seconds. Could they be, added five, for good it's measure. Fascinating five minutes. Though. It's the it's Sunday really... after the first full moon, mm -hmm. after March 21st, and uh, Passover is on the full moon, and so we're good. Okay, good. They'll never be on the same day. Okay, Part, okay, that's that's okay. That's good to know. They'll mm -hmm. never be. On but the they same almost day. were. And that, and, that, and that was the confusion. They're very close this year. Yeah, and, and 2019, everything lands in the religious. Possible, most religious possible way. Yeah. Passover is on yeah. Thursday, Day. which is Holy Thursday. Thursday. Passover, you have your Seder. Yeah. It's rumored that the, the last, last supper, supper was with a Seder. Seder. Yeah, so, even then, I know that. And then Good Friday, mm. Jesus gets tortured and crucified. Mm. Why it's called Good, I don't know. Oh, no, yeah, exactly. But it's yeah. one of the mysteries of the <laughs> Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, three days, you know, on the third day, um, a Sunday, he rose. And then you get Easter. That's the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, oh, plus they had to go through a lot to turn the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. The Sabbath was everybody's it was Sabbath. Sabbath. It was yeah, Sabbath. So they, they had to turn. And it now to you study. have a, the Christian Sabbath. They said we can't do it. You can't do this with the Jews. Jews yeah. are bad. Uh -huh. So move, pick another day. So they pick Sunday. But if you look at the name for Saturday <laughs> in the Romance languages, uh, in I'm Spanish, it's Sab Sa Sabado. It's all Sabbath. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, it's all it's all rooted there. Yeah, I love I love letting you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and it, the funny thing it's is, it's the seventh day. God rest it. Yeah. And, and and a and sabbatical. We, you go on a sabbatical. It's the seventh year. See, it's any, all good. Any other? Any? No, we're good. <laughs> Beat that one into the ground. What's next in your note? In your the notepad? one thing I hadn't intended to talk about was Easter and Passover. Okay. This, in, no, it's good. But as an example, but you, know, my goal is to sort of never to know when Easter or Passover is. But anyway, <laughs> now you know. I, yeah, now I know. Um, but the point that I was getting at was 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 discovering you're wrong is fun, but it's also. But I want to combine it with this awe thing we were talking about before. Let Let's talk about something that is fascinating uh, in a in a cosmic sense. I just want to talk about the the black hole observation, which uh, uh, for a second, the recent one, which is no doubt pro is far provoked incredible awe and wonder in everybody. Ban I banner I, headlines in all the major newspapers. Yeah, and you probably got a million requests that I did about to talk about it, some or at least to 
comment about I it. I declined all requests uh-huh. because okay. I was not in a position to answer those questions uniquely. Oh, uh-huh. And when I do that, it forces the media to, to, go, to fatten go. their Rolodex yeah, 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 and yeah. find any physicist. Great. Any, okay. And it was good. So I was, I, and the same with the eclipse, the 2017 the August eclipse. eclipse. Yeah. I, I did not offer myself to be interviewed. You can get um, community college professors, local yeah. planetarium folk, any number of thousands of people could be interviewed so, for that. Uh, uh, what is it that makes you decide when you're a unique source? Is if it I think you, I have a unique take? Yeah, a, a unique take. Or a unique, or if it needs me because no one else knows why it's interesting. If everyone already knows it's interesting, you don't yeah, need me. Yeah, yeah. I think my biggest, my biggest contribution is helping people recognize what is mind blowing in the world mm-hmm. that they might not have otherwise seen. Yeah. Okay. And I, I think I can do that. Oh no! And no, I think you, that's you what. The, the, by the way, there's a whole chapter in astrophysics for people in a hurry. Mm. On the periodic table of elements, for goodness yeah, sake. But why it's fascinating. And, and, and so I just riff on the periodic table of elements. What you surely thought you'd never see after high school chemistry. Mm-hmm. And there it is in a best-selling book. And so I'm I'm happy to say that that was succeeded in yeah. having people celebrate something that they always knew was there but never really thought to think about it. Okay. No, that, yeah, I agree. I think that's wonderful. It's always I, I give an example. Okay. Uh, let me give my opinion of art. Okay. I think an artist, an artist's task is not to capture that which is evident to everyone mm-hmm. for being extraordinary. Mm-hmm. They should capture things that we forgot to notice or never noticed at all. And let's take music, for example. Mm-hmm. There's Obviously, there's some important exceptions to this. Yeah, yeah. Um, holding aside the fact that Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture was panned when it first was written. Yeah. It's a highly celebrated thing for a yeah. big event. Okay, yeah. fine. But have you ever heard Beethoven's Wellington Victory? I, it's one of the worst pieces of music I've ever heard in my life. Okay. You've never heard it, because it's... No, no, that's I why you've have. never heard I'm, it. Uh, yeah, I'm it's, not good at labeling. But okay, I, I Wellington, listen a lot of Wellington music. defeats Napoleon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. go to your greatest composer yeah, to, of the day, day and, say, and give me something to commemorate this, and I'm saying... What is this? What have you done here? Mm-hmm. You, you've wasted my... There might, there might be some Wellington Victory fans Wellington. out there yeah. for this piece of music, <laughs> yeah. but I bet you if you speak for, to music scholars, it would be very low on the, in the portfolio of Beethoven compositions. Yeah. Uh, that's one of many examples I can give. Let's go to poetry, okay? okay. Um, who is Paul Revere? <laughs> who is he? You mean the... the who is he? Yeah, well, he's, he's famous in American history, that Paul Revere... For, for, for what? his for his ride, which he which he. Pro- okay, not, I was waiting. I know you're not I know. famous in American I, I, history. I, yeah. He was the, who I who I, knows I, in feeding, any war that has, with the in any war that is, that it? has ever been a, a, a um, pewter. A, yeah, uh, pewter, yeah a pewter. I have seven. Who seven knows, seven. knows in any war that has ever been fought the name of the person who told everybody. The enemy is coming. coming. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you know that name of that person in any war that has ever been fought? No. No, no. no. But you know Paul Revere. Why? Because a poet, poet. wrote a poem about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. He took a he, the nighttime writer. Yeah. D- can you name generals from the from that war other than General Washington? No. No, you can't. But you name Paul Revere. I can, I, I can name the British ones because I grew up in Canada. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the poet. Now, I don't know if the midnight rival of Paul Revere is considered high poetry, yeah. but it's memorable poetry. Yeah, okay. okay? Uh, how about Joyce Carol? Um, no, I mean, Joyce Kilmer. Uh, uh, yeah. Joyce Kilmer. Mm-hmm. What's her most famous poem? It's yeah. about a tree. Yeah, okay. A tree? Mm-hmm. Is it about some famous event, some general, some then, battle? But, but, some, some, no, it's about a tree. And you read that poem, you never look at a tree the same way again, and you've been walking by him every day of your life. Yeah, so so you're right, but that's the look. I think so I say it a different therefore, way. Therefore, that's what I'm saying. I'm, okay. My my what I I see one of my tasks yeah. is to help people celebrate things about the world, about the universe, about laws of, mm-hmm. of physics that they either take for granted or never knew were there, and they walk away from it having a new appreciation of their world. Well, look, and I, and that's that's. I'm sorry a to one, scream at you again. It's okay. I you like make it. me scream at you all the all time. All the time, and I love it. I know you mean well. <laughs> <laughs> but no, but I, I, I guess I, I I think of it the same way, but I think of it, uh, I put it slightly differently, so, which is that it's great that you gave poetry, 
art and music as examples. Because I always point out one of my... Oh, and what's so, on my wall here? As I know, I... Uh, okay, you, this you starry night. You've done that riff in my... In my in, I, I in, did in, in, in your... In your <laughs> in my uh, event at Phoenix. I, at your event, yeah, I wore a starry yeah, night. Yeah, yeah, Van Gogh's starry yeah, night t-shirt. You, took it on, you did a striptease this, first. This painting, mm -hmm. is it of a battle? Yeah. Is it of a famous... No. It is one of the most famous paintings in the world. Yeah. In part, somebody wrote a song about it. It's called Starry, Starry, Starry Night. Yeah, yeah. That's in part. In part, I think it was full. In part, well, it wasn't until it got more famous that the Museum of Modern Art, because yeah. it's here in New York City, yeah. put it on a more visible wall. Yeah, it used yeah. to be around the corner in the back mm -hmm. in a room that was not centered. I remember this. Okay. okay, and then they put a fancier frame around it. They're responding to the public's reaction mm -hmm. as the popularity of Van Gogh has risen, mm -hmm. because Van Gogh has been written about in, in movies and pop mm -hmm. culture, and so it's because the poet, the artist, took ownership of Van Gogh. I don't think he did. He he portrayed any famous anything. Yeah, he wore he he did sunflowers. But it's, but it's okay. I think I'm a, be a little more just about portraying famous things in the sense that, or things that people think are already extraordinary. Well, but and, and, and the famous I'm one of George Washington. Head wise, but I know I'm. What's not the gonna... most famous painting of George Washington? <laughs> okay. What is the most famous one? It, the crossing the crossing Delaware. Crossing the Delaware. Course, yeah, is yeah. he in him in battle? Yeah, yeah. Is it him punching somebody out? He's him standing there in a freaking boat. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Crossing the Delaware. Okay. A completely unmemorable thing, but rendered memorable by the creativity of an yeah. artist. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so I- Now I'm shut up about artists. What you've demonstrated there was that what I think is why, if you ask me what, what my sort of overriding- goal is in that sense is to demonstrate that science is part of our culture that science art music and literature are the same thing and I, the way i put it in maybe a less poetic or soundbite way maybe maybe not is that the i view the goal of science or that one of the beauties of science and the reason it's the same as art music and literature is each of them forces us to reassess our place in the cosmos to re see how we fit in to the universe a good poem a good piece of music, a good piece of art, forces you to reassess what you always thought the universe was all about, or your personal universe, if it's a story about something you can resonate to, and science does that very well, and that's why we have to celebrate it. Not because science has the misfortune of also producing technology. So people will all, I don't know if people come up to you because astronomy isn't practical, and the people come up to me all the time and say, what's the use of this? Because they're trained to think that science produces useful things, lights, motors, engines, it's changed our life. We're here because of medicine. But, you know, Picasso or, or Van Gogh did, didn't produce something that, that you know, allowed you to live longer. So never people ever say, what's the use of a Van Gogh painting? Because they don't know it has that technology. Science does. So unfortunately, people think science is only useful because of its technology. But I think you and I would agree that the real virtue of science is exactly that, is to inspire us to re reassess ourselves. But on the other hand, I would disagree. I would say it's okay to portray things that people already think is ex are extraordinary if, they, if you reveal new facets of it. Rainbows are something people are fascinated by. But Feynman did a big riff once about how knowing how a rainbow works doesn't make it less beautiful. It makes it more beautiful. I have the... Uh the New York Times from January 20, from June 21st, um, 1969, mm -hmm. okay? And it covers the moon landing that mm -hmm. took yeah. place on June 20th. Yeah. yeah. There's an entire pullout section where poets and writers are waxing yeah, about yeah, yeah. this event. Mm -hmm. And is the most boring yeah, yeah, yeah. tracts of literature. I, we have reached out to <laughs> touch the sky, yeah. and we've pierced the image of our ignorance, and we have we have opened a new. It's like, do I need the poet to make me excited about landing on the moon? Mm -hmm. No, the event is sufficient enough to trigger whatever emotion I need in me. I don't need the artist for that. Yeah. Okay. By the way, none of those poems survive to this day. Dig them up. It's like you can't even read them. I was just saying, I'm being very opinionated here. I'm not normally opinionated. Well, in no, I'm glad. Well, that's the bottom line is there are things that are fascinating intrinsically, but it, but it's always possible to add something new and interesting to those things. Of course, can, and and so the fact that it already is wonderful, there are things that I'm sure you've commented on that people have found fascinating where you think you have a new take. Right? It's not you don't do it. Rainbows among them. Yeah, exactly. I okay. tweeted once. People, yeah, people didn't know. I said, everyone sees their own rainbow. 
I mean, because it's where you're standing. Every yeah. rainbow mm -hmm. is unique to every person who sees it. And that's why every rainbow is exactly sideways to you. <laughs> You've never seen a rainbow edge on. Yeah. Or yeah, at, a, yeah, yeah, at, a, at a proportional angle. And 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 if you approach a rainbow, it stays that distance from you. Yeah. So this is why you can never, never get, get to the, the pot, of, the pot, pot of gold. It's a good place to put the pot of gold. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it a, it's a good place to say it's there because you know someone can ever <laughs> reach right. it. Right. No, excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I want to, there's a few more. Look, before we get to the last, I want to talk about space at some point because I know we've had interesting discussions about that. That's and it right. puts it at space. Space exploration. Space. <laughs> the final frontier. Um, no, it's just the next it. frontier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> The next frontier. I like that. Okay. Um, but I do want to talk about humor a little bit because that um, that helps in my, I mean, it, it, it's integral to my own approach just because I like jokes, but I, I know it is for you too. And I think you have a, I'm, I'm reasonably certain you have a thought process for why you, why you want to include humor in your discussions of science. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Well, a couple of fundamental facts. And maybe facts. tell me a good joke, too. Sure. Yeah. Uh, a couple of fundamental facts uh -huh. that that when people are happy, they're more, they come back for more. Mm -hmm. So you get the repeat visitor. Yeah. That's one fact. Another fact, I found that people, um, if they're happy, they're more willing to learn. It's related to becoming a repeat yeah, visitor. Sure, sure. They're more willing to stay mm -hmm. and, and not run away. Mm -hmm. But not only that, I think people like having fun. Yeah, of course. More than they like not having fun. Yeah, I think that. I think that's an empirically right. obvious fact. So even though while you're in college, you attend lectures, the word lecture is a bad word for all of your life after college. Yeah, yeah. Don't lecture me on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, why are you lecturing me? Stop lecturing <laughs> me. All of a sudden, lecture is a bad yeah. word uh -huh. when that was the fundamental thing of what's going on in college. So the implication is the lectures don't contain humor. Mm -hmm. And if there was the lectures that did, you remembered that class and you enjoyed it and you yeah. were on time every day. Yeah. yeah. The format of uh, my Star Talk radio program is mm -hmm. I, my co-host is always a professional stand-up comedian. Yeah, yeah. They Hello. bring a source of levity to mm -hmm. the conversations. My academic expert that I bring in, if it's not myself, depending mm -hmm. on the topic, they bring a source of gravity to the conversation. Mm -hmm. So you have the levity and the gravity and I, I have a valve that vents or does not one or both of those at any given moment to make sure we hit a c consistent delivery of content and fun. I tried to I tried to violate that when I was on Star Trek. I tried <laughs> to be a source of levity as well as gravity. But. Yeah, so I also think the universe is particularly hilarious. Yeah. So I don't actually tell jokes. Yeah. I just Find talk humor. about things in ways that the context can be humorous and make you smile. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I use humor is it is it opens people up. It 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 removes barriers. Mm -hmm. And I heard someone say that you, you told to them you you told them, and I thought it was it was a w different way of framing. And I thought it was a nice thing. And I was is that is that you, you can't l laugh and be afraid at the same time. That 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 sort of humor removes the fear, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is a really. I don't think I said that, but, but someone told me. So, you said oh, it. someone I, they probably heard it on a Star Talk because okay. I've interviewed some key. Oh, you know who did it? You know who said that it was uh, Stephen Colbert. Oh, okay. Sitting sitting in this chair yeah, with yeah. me interviewing him. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's but it is and yeah. and and point is so, that So this they associate me with it cuz I was on, on the program. On the program. Yes. But I think that for me that's the point. I mean, science be, not not because it intrinsically is, but largely partly because the educational system that you talked about where people try and steer people away if they can and especially if they're stereotyping them. Mm -hmm. Uh but people have this impedance barrier or this this fear, this wall that science is something to be afraid of. And so if it's funny, then it doesn't, then at least you've tried to tear that down that wall a little bit. For me, that's part of the reason. Also, because I, I you know, I do find the universe absurd. And I think, um, um, interesting, Gail Collins was saying that that to try and write something that people don't want to kill themselves, you, you don't want to, it, it can be depressing, but it's more fun if it's absurd. Mm -hmm. And uh, and, uh, and and so it's- I, that's, I think, that's how and why I titled my one of my books, Death by Black Hole. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I was going to ask you about that. Is that would that be your favorite way of dying? Oh, no, it's it'd be my preferred way. I, I, favorite is probably not the right. Yeah, word. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If I'd rather, if Detroit's getting hit by a bus, mm -hmm. um, withering away on a deathbed, or falling into a black hole, and being able to report to others right till the last moment mm -hmm. where I can't, mm -hmm. yeah, then I'll be part of an experiment. I would totally do that. You'd rather be part of the experiment. Oh yeah. You know, although F Feynman said, you know, when he was he he did that when he was dying. He said, I'm going to, you know, basically report the experience. And he said it was very boring. <laughs> no, really. He he thought, 
you know, he would take, he would, of course, didn't die, he died of cancer, unfortunately, but, but he, uh, he was, as he did everything in his life, it was sort of, I want to learn well, to what clear, this is like. You say, unfortunately, not specifically because he died of cancer, but he died younger than he otherwise would yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, well, both yeah. ways. I mean, it's yeah. sort of, you know, uh -huh. you're right, younger than people he would die, have otherwise. So people die, it happens. It's not unfortunately he died. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, he died sooner than. It's, it's, yeah, it's not, and if, in my case, it was personal. I, he died before I got to tell him something else that I'd meant to tell him, and I was really sad that I never, which is why I've, I've, uh, at, at, because that's why you're was, telling me everything that's on your mind yeah, about me. That's <laughs> exactly why. That's not exactly the reason, but but it's probably I don't know. I mean, Feynman had an impact me. That maybe that Sagan had on you, and and um, it's why I've told people that if they want to, uh, if they shouldn't hold back, if they want to relate to someone, it's a good idea to do it when you have the opportunity rather than later on because you mm -hmm. often regret it. And and let me let me then. There's two, there's one last thing I want to ask you. Tw Twitter has been a huge part. You you were one of the earliest, as far as I know, kind of adopt. Uh, no, not earliest in the Twitterverse, but earliest to use it as an educational platform. I would say because the early users were all. Oh, I'm having a hamburger now. Yeah. I'm crossing the pond. I'm going to yeah. see this movie. Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, yeah. And it's more a, a, a storytelling of your life rather than as a tool. Yeah. So I may have been. I certainly was in my own field. Um, I don't know about other educational... But, but you use it, but I was intrigued when you say you use it empirically because when you talk to an audience, you can use it empirically or talk to people, you can see if their eyes are glazing over or what else. Yeah. But one of the only problems I can see with Twitter, and maybe this is adjusted, I'm wondering how you've adjusted your Twitter, Twittering from being just wonderful sound bites to get people thinking to maybe something else, is that it seems to be a medium that unfortunately does encourage negativity in response more than almost any other medium I know. And I wonder how you respond to that. It encourages negativity when you say something that someone else doesn't agree with. If you express an opinion, there will be people who have a different opinion. And we live in a world where if you're not gonna talk about the opinion, you'll be attacked for your opinion. Yeah, That is what's changed in this world. Yeah, And I knew that early on in Twitter. So I said, I will never present an opinion. Okay, and but, so mm -hmm. the negativity lands on hollow ground, and others who read a negative comment, that's not what he said. Okay, well, yeah, no, no, he no. But aren't what, you? I agree. But aren't you surprised? I mean, or are you surprised? And does it disappoint you that you write something, or you know, or I write something about science, which is wonderful, and people say, "Oh yeah, but but I hate you for this," or I or "Oh yeah, but some," you know, they'll find some reason to dislike. It. And you're right. No, they're like that on that level. They're just trolls, and you just yeah. You just keep moving. But I, but it's interesting that that medium. Encourage, it seems to some. Well, trolls are for, everywhere. Trolls have been maybe not trolls so on Reddit before yeah. Twitter even existed. Trolls are just a part of life. Well, well unlike a stand-up comic, I found, for example, that trolls are rarely at public events. I mean, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, no, seriously. I mean, well, it's rare that I, I that we've done a, a lot of public events together. Uh -huh. It's rare. It's efforts every now and then, but it's rare that someone makes an effort to try and sort of confront you as like they might a comic. Have you found that? Um, sure, but again, I'm less confrontable if I'm not always trying to tell you what your opinion should be or who you should vote for or what politician you should love or hate. I just mm -hmm. don't do that. I give you information that you okay, well, fold let's ask into your worldview okay. and then make your own opinion. Okay, let's end asking you some opinions. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, specifically— I, I don't care that other people know my opinions. I just don't care. No, no that's fine. Because no. they're my opinions. No, no, I— w And nor do I want people— to adopt my opinion because yeah, they like your, me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I want them to make their own opinion you because, I've, because I've, as an educator, I have fed them tools to shape opinions of their own that would be informed, ideally, mm -hmm. that are thought through, mm -hmm. ideally. Mm -hmm. And in that way, we have a more, inf a more, a more powerful democracy. Yeah, of course. Yes. That's, in fact, it's the essential part of democracy. Yes. And it, unless you have an informed public, you can't possibly, mm -hmm. and ultimately informed, informed legislators. Uh, inform, informed electorate. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, informed electorate, yes. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, informed legislators at some level. And if the public is informed in principle, they would vote for That's informed why I said legislators. Electorate. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about opinions, uh, not uh, informed opinions about space, because we've had these discussions, and I don't think people, re you know, people think we somehow are angry about it partly because you, li you like to yell at me, but it's relevant now because we are in principle, it seems to me, at the, tr at the cusp of something that you pointed out very eloquently when we've had debates about human explorations of space. And you pointed out when I said once, you jumped on me, I remember once, that I was saying, you know, human exploration of space has not, you know, is, is not 
best way to do science. And you jumped in and said, but Lawrence, it's never had to do with science. It was always geopolitical. And you talked about the moon landing as a geopolitical enterprise. So, and, so and, we were in violent agreement with each other. Yeah. I was just noting that you implied by your comment yeah, yeah. that it once did yeah. and now it doesn't, okay, okay. but it never no, did. But, but the interesting question I have now is, we're we, it's, we're almost in the cusp of that now we're, in terms of, we saw Mr. Pence talk about the United States trying to go back to the moon in five years. It um, seems to me practically unlikely that that may happen, but there's a reason for it because we're seeing India and China. It's going back to the moon has become once again a mark of national prestige and national eminence. And I wanted to wanted to get your reflection on whether so, I, I worry it's that a lot of money is going to be diverted to that enterprise that could be spent on other aspects of space exploration, which I find more fascinating. And I wanted to get your take on that. It's not about prestige or eminence. You can get that, but it's never been about that. It's been about power. It's okay. power. Power. Well, okay, prestige and it, yeah, power. And okay, with power can come prestige and eminence. Yeah, yeah. But it's but what drives it is power. What kind of power? Military, military power. Military power. Or okay. or soft power works as well in the interest of your military ambition, um, mission statement. So soft power is you come to Rome and you see they built the Colosseum mm -hmm. and you say, oh my gosh, who are these people who did this? So soft power being the technology, the demonstration of- Demonstration of, of what so, you can do. Of the, exactly. Yes. So it's a demonstration and of technology. And that way is don't fuck with us. Yeah, okay. All right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's, it's in the subtext yeah. of what the- what the demonstrated power so is. So let's put the current, okay. let's put the current, what's going on in, in perspective and and where would you like to see it go? Where do you think it's going to go? And uh, yeah, both those. Yeah, so the motivation- you've had an instrument relationship The motivation to do so is, yeah, it's India, but it's also China. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So primarily China, I would yeah, say. I, I think so too. China says they're going to do something and they do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's amazing. It's, they it's do pretty, it. <laughs> yeah. we'll just do it. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, they have the power over- Industry and money. Well, they have and a, allocations to. Yeah, to, they have a dictatorship. Which yeah, helps. yeah, yeah. So something that a democracy can only do once everybody agrees. And if we live in a fundamentally disagree, I'm not sure everyone. Agrees. You could when the yeah. Anyway, what do you on. mean? Well, democracy does things not when everyone agrees, but when you convince enough people who are. There controlled. are tipping points yeah. where enough people agree where it might as well be everyone agrees. Yeah, okay. Because Fine. all votes then go in that direction, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're done. Yeah, yeah right. Okay. So. So it's how we could get into the Second World War as thoroughly as we did. Yeah, yeah. It's how we can found NASA as quickly as we did. On the on your birthday, right? A day before. Day before a year and a day before my birthday. I heard someone from someone was telling me that. And I thought, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, okay. No, sorry, so, sorry, I didn't say that right. NASA was founded the same week I was born. Sputnik was a year and a day before. Okay, my NASA birthday. was founded the same week. You the were same born. week, right? Okay, and you've and you've been involved in NASA in advisory panels and, yeah, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. celebrated for that. So you have a, an experiential relationship with NASA yes. as well, and so NASA. So NASA is going to also be doing with the public, and that matters here. Yeah, yeah. NASA is not some isolated agency. Yeah, it, more than any other, it's it's sort of plays correct. plays to the public. Correct. It really does play much more efficiently to the public than the National Science Foundation or the or It's Department. why people think NASA's budget is way bigger than it actually yeah, is. Because of, I want to start a movement where all agencies get paid what people think they're getting. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, no, I was once, the Department of Energy once put together a group that I was on. How can we be as effective as NASA in terms of trying to promote what we, you know, we're trying mm -hmm. to do? Which, though, NASA's done it effectively. But now we're going to spend a lot of money, and there's a lot of neat projects. And you know that I have a huge love of machine of of non-humans exploring the universe. Uh, I find it, not just from a scientific perspective, I actually find it more romantic. I find rovers on Mars more romantic than if a human were on Mars, personally. But why I, didn't, okay, well then, had we not sent people to the moon, would you have been as enchanted by science? I was younger then. What I'm saying is, there was a rover on the moon at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No one knew, because we were sending people to the moon. Yeah. You can say all you want about how good robots are, you put a person in any place a robot is, the robot is chopped liver relative to the interest and energy that would be invested in following and tracking the human beings who are Why? where the ro rovers are. Why do you Because we are humans. Well, I, maybe. I, I actually, Maybe? No, we are humans. Okay, we what? had this debate. Well, some of us. Um, but I would also argue it's because humans can die. When a robot, when the rover dies, it's just not as interesting. 
I know I sound very cynical about that, but I think we are we find astronauts exciting because they're 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 confronting death. They're brave. They're 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 going boldly, going where no one's gone before. But there's a reason no one's gone before. I don't have an argument with that, but let me enhance it. Okay, by whatever genetic encoding the human species has endured over the millennia, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, one thing is for sure. If somebody leaves the tribe and goes over the horizon mm -hmm. and comes back, you want to know what they saw, what they, you want to know everything, every story they can possibly tell. And that has been the stuff of legends ever since we've been able to, to communicate with each other, with one another. And so, so these are the voyages of Odysseus. Of, yeah. These are voyages that Starship people take. Enterprise, and yeah. then you come back uh -huh. and you tell yeah. your story. Uh -huh. Statues are built to those people. I've yet to see a statue built to a robot. Well, so you should not deny humans the value of the story that another human brings back to us. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. we can then tell. Yeah, no, I think that that's a beautiful. And I'm taking my cue from the history of this exercise in our species. Yeah, I suspect in the future robots will be able to tell stories, and and people will find. In fact, they may be better at it. But that's a wonderful way to end this discussion because one of the reasons why I wanted to hear your stories is you have gone over the horizon in 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 communication and under, and and discussion and I wanted you to come back and tell me your stories and as always in spite of the yelling <laughs> I, think, I find it fascinating I think you can agree cuz you've been in this you you you've been on tour with yeah. um you you made a movie this yeah. sort of thing I am astonished every morning i look wake up and look at how many people follow me on twitter mm. i feel like reminding them at least once a week you realize you're following an astrophysicist <laughs> yeah. there's still time to yeah. pull out yeah. i'm astonished that i can show up in a theater and have it on a thursday night date mm. night yeah. yeah and have a full yeah. house of yeah. people coming just to hear about science i'd like to think however delusional this is that given all the challenges that scientists and scientific ideas confront in modern culture, mm -hmm. that there's a groundswell of people, if they're not scientifically literate, they want to be. Yeah, there is. And they value all of the efforts that scientists have put in to write books, to make YouTube mm -hmm. videos, yeah. to yeah. Mm -hmm. testify yeah. in, in court, which yeah. I've never done. You've been yeah. there, yeah. And, I've, I've, and I tell you anytime I see you, you're, you're one of our bulldogs. You go in there, fighting that fight in the trenches, and when, anytime science confronts um, religion in a, mm. in a in a in in in, a, in the school classroom, for mm. example, um, that these are important frontiers. So, but I'd like to think that we are transitioning from a culture and a society that didn't care about science or didn't know how how and why science mattered yeah. to a culture this certainly this next generation, thirty and under, yeah. to who who are ready to say an understanding of science is the difference between a future where I'm alive and a future where my descendants are dead. I, I, certainly, I certainly hope that. I think I'm maybe more optimistic. I think people have always been fascinated with science. Producers didn't understand that people are fascinated by science. And I'm just really happy that there are people like you who for whatever accidents of history or innate talent have been able to convince the public and to some extent producers that there's that that need that desire and that the end product can be so good so thank you neil the origins podcast is produced by lawrence kraus nancy dahl amelia huggins john and don edwards and rob zepps directed and edited by gus and luke holwerda audio by thomas amison web design by redmond media lab animation by Tomahawk Visual Effects, and music by Rickolis. To see the full video of this podcast, as well as other bonus content, visit us at patreon.com slash originspodcast.